everybody, and welcome to the season two of Wheel of Time rant. Today, I am going to be giving my full hindsight thoughts on the Wheel of Time show uh, now that I have consumed it about three times. And the formatting of this is going to be a bit ranty because I feel like it's appropriate. There's already these like hyper structured reviews that I have for each episode. And it's just a bit more fun to see someone pop off uh, off the top of the dome sometimes. I know some of you really enjoy that. So that is how I'm approaching this season two review. And I'm also gonna be getting into some of the elements around the show that have been bugging me, even a little bit of the fandom that's been challenging me and uh, it's gonna be a good old time. Before we get into that though, I just wanna say thank you to today's sponsor, which is going to be this, this stupid guy. Because this video is brought to you by my War of the World special edition on Kickstarter, uh, which is currently still available for about 24 more hours, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on when I get this video out. And in my humble opinion, as the art director of this book, this is the best edition of War of the Worlds you can get in this price range because our entire philosophy behind it was to show you how much the big publishers are screwing you over with their quote unquote special editions, where so often the only thing that's special about them is the fact that they have like a limited release and maybe a new cover. No, nay sir, that's not special, that's artificial. Book that is brimming with additional art, new covers, casings going on, and just a premium feel at the same price range of many of those big publisher special editions. And we're blowing them out of the water, if I can just, if I can just say that. In my, in my opinion. So if you would like to back this Kickstarter project, get your hands on a classic I highly believe is worth your time, go ahead and just click the links down below and you'll also be supporting my badass indie publisher, Wraith Marks Creative. All right, season two of The Wheel of Time in a ranty format. Overall, this season in terms of just level of entertainment was head and shoulders above season one. Just going ahead and getting my number review out of the way for like the season as a whole. Uh, I think season one still sits at like a light five. It's not great. This season I would put in the light seven territory where it's like, yeah, there are flaws here. It's not a masterpiece, not something I think deserves to be like heralded as like show of the year, but it was definitely entertaining. In the moment, season two, I was hooked on the screen. And it often wasn't until the credits started rolling that my mind started getting into the flaws of the show in a bigger picture. It seems like what they are managing to accomplish is self-contained stories often within episodes that have interesting angles to them and within the bounds of that runtime are enjoyable enough, but it's the connective tissue from episode to episode where we're really starting to see the worst qualities of the show fall into the spotlight. I mean, the early episodes I just didn't like. No more land peeing on trees. More land being a mentor, please. But the vast majority of the season, I would say from like the early midpoint until just before the very end, each episode was enjoyable. And there were some storylines that were actually very cohesive and felt well conceptualized from beginning to end. Egwene, premium example. And The Forsaken, which I feel it like could be easier to forget because it is more of like the background scheming, but how cohesive both land fear and as Shemile's plans were, was super engaging. It makes total sense, their motivations and how Lanfear wants to screw over the person who freed her, but also has to work within the bounds of fearing him and also not directly working against the shadow. These people know they're going to betray each other. That's their significant weakness. And that's one of the few uh, attempted themes of this season that I have problems with, but I can't deny was executed to an extent. And that's that the shadow can't really have friends. Uh, they can't have allies. Well, the light can, and that's one of the big advantages of the light. I think the shadow part of that theme, really well handled. The light part of it fumbled significantly, but we'll get into that. Uh, first though, I wanna bring up what Sanderson said in our live stream, and I agree with largely, and that is that the show is also on the broader season picture, really struggling with arcs. Some characters 
had arcs here, Egwene, but even the accomplished arcs of Egwene getting hardened, uh, really like coming into her own and power don't connect though to the seasons theme, which it tried to then pivot and have at the end. And it's one of the big themes from Robert Jordan himself. One of the themes of the Wheel of Time is reliance on friends, not to get into full book spoilers, but there is a very late series monologue about how important it is that this isn't just one person's story, it's a team's story. And so the show suddenly on top of this tower being like, oh, everyone's coming together. It's this big, bad moment. They're all relying on each other. When Egwene just freed herself and got through all of this on her own, which she didn't in the books, feels a little self-contradictory within the narrative. So when Elaine and Nynaeve don't free Egwene like they do in the books, and they just manage to hobble up a high tower despite Elaine having just had an arrow in her knee, somehow having not run into Perrin, who just got there before them, meaning Elaine is a very, very quick wounded Hopper. Hey, Hopper, that's another thing we need to talk about. It just starts to feel clunky, not only in the blocking of that scene, but in the messaging. Elaine and Nynaeve didn't conquer their hurdles or free Egwene because of working together. Perrin just kind of met some new people, watched a friend of his died, and then murdered an old man. And Matt's conflict was super self-contained and was all about how he really couldn't trust Min, the one friend he had made. Rand, on the other hand, I mean, I guess kind of learned to trust Moraine, but even then was pulled away from her and was working on his own, actually just with a Forsaken for quite a long time. So at the end of the season, having them all come together to defeat Ashamael, that needed to be so much more for this messaging of like friendship and like working together, having allies depending on another to be the reason they took him down, which I would love that to be the reason that these five together are able to take a Shemael down. And this was a really great interpretation of a Shemael. Vague spoilers, his development throughout the series within Wheel of Time is complex. And he starts, just for the books we're talking about, not anything else I'm gonna talk about in the future, mad. You think I'm crazy? And seeing this interpretation where he starts not mad just raised all these red flags for me. Cause it's justified why he doesn't just Boop. Rand in the beginning of the series in the books because he's crazy and he's trying to prove something to the man that Rand uh, is the reborn of that is still in there according to Shamael. And so having him not be mad, I'm like, why isn't he just obliterating him? That is very well explained in the show. He is trying to still prove a point, but they managed to communicate the friendship angle between Luz, Lanfear, and Shamael quite well. And so I'm like 100% invested in that. So it feels like they're so well set up to have Luz or Rand's current friends step in and prove a Shamael wrong. It's just that when they finally step in, instead of feeling like these really complex webs coming together that Robert Jordan so often landed in the series, we just have Perrin with a shield. He got handed by a guy who died. And I guess we're just going to assume the people who have not read the Bex have just no idea why Udo is currently in that horn or what that means. All right. I know book reasons, but if you are a show viewer first time like Kayla is, I have to then explain a whole bunch. The show just did not have time to. If, if you're going to take one thing away from this video, for the love of God, not eight episodes, 12 minimum. And then we will start getting the eight to nine to 10 out of 10 seasons for Wheel of Time. I just straight up don't think we're going to get high above seven much at all if we continue to be constrained, in my subjective opinion, to eight episodes. It's just not enough because you lose so much lore detail, so much story detail that, yeah, you end up at this scene, back to what I was talking about, on top of a tower where Perrin's handed a shield. You have to like super read between the lines to understand. And then like there's magic system inconsistencies. Rand's unblocked because we have five minutes left and he slowly walks his sword into a Shemael who, yeah, through his philosophy of wanting it all to end, just accepts death. And, and then let's Rand stab him because his plan feels cool. I actually have like a total conspiracy brain thing where I think one of the reasons they aren't super fleshing out all of Robert Jordan's hyper specific rules for his magic systems within the show uh, is because they want to keep them a bit more wobbly so that in the finale like this, when you need so many things to happen that 
probably would not have happened if those firm rules about power limitation and distance and all of that were in place. Like, it couldn't occur. Yeah, I feel like the reason they aren't going super in depth with like classroom scenes in the White Tower about channeling is because it would take away a writing crutch. Which talking, I think it was with Matt, I've had so many conversations about this finale since I watched it. Uh, there is an argument again, like there's always arguments to be made from the source material if you know it, that yeah, Ashemael wants to die. His whole philosophy is like, existence is pain. He is the Mr. Meeseeks of Forsaken. I can't take it anymore! I just wanna die! He wants it all to break and no more reality. So he sees an opportunity to die and he's like, cool. Won't get into what that contradicts in the books. That's a video for another day. And the performance, which I'm not going to just continue to heap praise on the performances in this video. I made it very clear throughout the season that I think they are just all around. Like this is just the right cast for this show. And they are doing so much heavy lifting to elevate what is very conflicting writing. But he then has that beautiful moment. Yeah. Okay. Nothing. I love it. And he, he fades away. That beat amongst this not super smooth series of beats actually managed to like pull me back in. That was really, really great. I can just so easily see how with a few tweaks though, this can be changed from a single great moment to a well-earned actual conclusion that thematically ties into so much else with just a few tweaks here and there that all rely on some more runtime, which ah, the one thing that just like boils all arguments down to like being so simple is like, yeah, the friends atop the tower, one should have gotten to that point atop the tower in a more sensical, uh, thematically resonant way so that they could have this fight. I would have loved to have seen this version of Matt who just got his memories apparently due to the line, I remember, and then wielding the Ash and Darai, which we so well, then coming up and actually being a threat to a Shamael and not someone who just throws a stick then gets lectured for not seeing through an illusion that he would have no way of seeing through, which Shamayel would know. It's that, that that is like very contained and conflicting in itself because Matt from the book is a threat to pretty much anybody. And if we had established what exactly his powers are, what he's gaining when he's saying, I remember, that could have been an actual moment of, oh damn put a certain necklace on the guy. That doesn't happen till later. Yeah, so much of what's in this season doesn't happen till later. But then he eventually gets overwhelmed, which is when Perrin gets to do a Taviran-esque, like awesome rage, wolf brother filled entrance. Uh, and then like together they're able to, with Egwene's channeling of actually distracting like a diverse set of attacks from a Shemile, uh, she's able to just like blunt force her way into being a large enough distraction. It's not just one simple shield somehow assisted conquering a Forsaken, but a series of Taviran working together. Yes, Egwene is Taviran in my mind uh, to provide the opportunity for Rand to break his shield that Moraine can accomplish in a way. You know what? Uh, we're, we're power scaling in the show is already skewed so much. I guess she can just do the same thing or she can just launch fireballs that light the boat on fire from a distance and have be something so direct regardless or just give her a little booster item. I don't know if we've established those enough in the show, but something that can be brought in later, like give Moraine an angle for. Wow, she's really good at stopping the same three attacks again and again and again. I do know how to just detonate someone's head. I, I know how to just destroy the floor below them, throw them into a dream world, create all kinds of illusions that could distract, like just a whole arsenal of stuff, but I, I just want to keep doing this. This is really fun. Look at all these fireballs. It was just for me, summarizing, an unfortunate combination of thematic failure and uh, technically clunky execution that made episode eight really not land on its feet. Though, there's still enough within the episode uh, that does relate back to themes throughout the season, again, especially around the Forsaken, that I'm enjoying the show. Like, yeah, I sound negative in what I'm saying there, but that's a specific criticism. As a whole, the broad picture, this show was so much fun and I had a great time with it, especially if I'm just like not in my mindset of I have to review and I'm actually just sitting in the chair enjoying it, which really I tried to focus on with the third time, is so much fun. My praise for Natasha 
Natasha O'Keefe uh, really can't go high enough. I maintain that yes, while Lanfear in the books has a little more uh, going on for her because of just the wider page count, this interpretation of the personality, creative choices in regards to how to realize the seductress evil trope, uh, just make this one of the performances of the year. If the show as a whole isn't a show of the year for me though, this performance is. There is that like oh so tempting pain and vulnerability that slips through for like half a second at time that even you as a viewer are like, oh then I love you. But there's that cruel, vile twist of intention uh, and action that makes her repugnant objectively, like if you're a good person watching her sew someone's mouth shut. So you end up in this position where you are like Rand, where like there's those moments where she gets close to him and you see Rand is just like, oh yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and you're like, I get it. But at the same time, there's that level of horror he has as well. And the fact that Lanfear wins. She's like at the end of this season, like that's exactly what I wanted. Perfect, perfect for her character. I enjoy this Lanfear more than I do Lanfear from the books at this point, which is a lot of praise. And on a similar level, I like Madeline Madden's Egwene just about the same as I did Egwene from the books at this point. Maybe even a touch more in some ways because she has brought this vulnerability and anger to the character in retaliation to the somewhat increased, not increased abuse from the Shan Chan we see in the show from the Zul Dom. I think it's just more explicit. Uh, Jordan, I think left some of the, it's been years since I've read this book, but I think he, he left some of the abuse more vague where the show is just deciding like, here it is. Like, this is how bad it's going to be. And so while yes, thematically, I'm like, oh, Egwene escaping with Nynaeve and Elaine's help probably would have worked better. That moment though, where she watches her Suldam hang. All I'm saying is with the line, like I will kill you being her only line from that one episode. <laughs> I'm still a fan of it. Like I want a way where I can have my cake and eat it too, where she's rescued by Nynaeve and Elaine, but also just watches her hang in that fashion. <laughs> that like that needs to happen somehow and I will be very happy. <clears throat> now with this perfectly smooth transition where nothing is different, revealing the fact that I actually record a lot of these videos in two sittings because I spilled something in my original shirt, uh, let's continue to talk about Egwene and the fact that yes, there is this like independence arc for her, but I actually think the show played quite nicely with the conflict at beginning springboarding this for her in terms of how like jealous she was with Nynaeve, then playing it into the storyline with her Suldam Damani relationship. I think it's actually a solid example of how conflicts don't have to resolve themselves directly within writing, but if a character grows and changes under extreme circumstances, you can still then know that conflict will be addressed and those two characters will be over it due to what they've been through. And yeah, I actually think it parallels Egwene's growth in the books in a faster condensed way, which this show absolutely needs to do. And yeah, okay, I'm sorry I spilled on my shirt and had to change and now you're gonna randomly get in splice me with a different shirt in this video. But to make up for that, it is a sneak peek at an upcoming merch drop here on the channel. So if you would like to, you know, look like a little stoned goblin with some books all around you, I'm gonna have that merch soon. That's I think the best way to describe my audience. Stoned goblins. Goofing aside, getting back into it, Egwene's arc is the most solid from this season in my opinion. I almost just wish there was like a super cut of this season where everyone's time on screen was just edited individually for them. So it became like blisteringly apparent what I'm talking about. Usually characters in a season of television like this have an initial conflict. Maybe that conflict changes and evolves as the series go on, but it's reflective of a wider theme that's usually shared among a cast of characters. And it comes especially when there's some big bag to fight down together with everyone overcoming their conflicts in a way that resonates with each other. But like Moraine and Lan, what was that? Like Moraine at the early part of the season has this fight where she takes on a bunch of Murdral and Lan helps her and at the end, he's like, what are you hiding from me? But at the end of the season, what we learn she's hiding from him is basically a willingness to go further like to kill a whole lot of people in service of Rand, which of course Lan has like no problem with. And I'm sorry, but that delivery of the line, like the only reason I was able to say we were not equals is because I think you're better than me. One, 
kind of goes against their relationship where both of them respect each other a whole lot, but as equals, which is again reaffirmed in the first season, they share butt water. I know she was also hiding the fact that Rand isn't dead, but that really didn't seem like a relevant enough thing to the wider story this season to have this entire conflict between the two of them hinge on it. Because aside from some emotional moments of people being like, Rand's alive, when did that come into play in a big way? It came into about as big a play as Perrin's dead wife, which which got one kind of mention in a scene a bit. And I just wish after this season had been written, they had gone back through and tweaked all of this stuff to be in line with the broader messaging. So these coming together moments at the end would feel more resonant. And then there's also just the issue of having everyone so split up, which again, you can attribute to issues of last season, where especially on the third watch through, while I was enjoying so many more of the cohesive narrative through lines of planning from the bad guys, it became apparent just how jarring it is to watch this season with how quickly we're cutting between people, which hampers the momentum overall the narrative to just an insane detriment, in my opinion. It's why one of the strongest episodes is Nynaeve's accepted test, because they devote so much screen time to just letting her presence build and become something that actually feels like it has a real momentum to it in the full runtime. And it's not just chop, 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 which is still unfortunately happening in that Next. episode, with the glowing example being them fleeing from the Shan Chan uh, after Leandra knocked them out of the tunnels, and Egwene is just captured without explanation, just as much explanation actually as Loyal getting the horn, which is just kind of casually said like, someone from Kakari and the noble woman from Landfear helped them. Great, like, uh, come on, there needs to be better than that. You have one shot to tell this story. Amazon, you have all the money in the world. Don't you care about giving it a big enough room to breathe so that yes, you pay up front more now, but in the long run, years down the road, the show has more episodes for you to profit off of and is better reviewed critically so that people keep shining up for your streaming service. Ah! Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Speaking of earlier on conflicts though, especially on a third rewatch, the manipulation of Nynaeve by Leandrin, trying to feel out like what exactly the potential of Nynaeve could be in the tower and how Leandrin has really just placed herself to be at odds with these two in a power dynamic where she is fully exploiting her position as Aes Sedai to get away with things she just absolutely should not, was such a great way to set up this villain. And I believe Leandrin on her own was a solid enough villain for the season. Like if we had cut out a bunch of others aside from maybe like just the Forsaken, I would still be here praising the season for its villains just because I enjoyed Leandrin and even seeing her dynamic with Lanfear. So yeah, you, you definitely have to keep the Forsaken, but that scene where Lanfear comes in and ends up like killing the kid she had been trying to keep alive for so long uh, was brutal, but also a perfect display of how loyalty to the shadow uh, is always going to end up biting you in the ass because apparently this was Leandrin's big push to join the shadow. And in the end, it was taken from her by the shadow, but she's so far down this path. There's, there's no way back for her. She is forever a dark friend. And so you end up having this like detestful hatred of Leandrin undercut by sympathy. And at the same time, Lanfear's being such a bad bitch that you're kind of like, mm, yeah, kill that dude. I mean, no, don't. That was a horrible thought. It was so cool though. Let's talk about what's probably the biggest elephant in the room though, when it comes to character. And that's going to be Rand Thor, who has certainly had cool moments. But again, I largely agree with Sanderson here. Cool moments do not a character arc make. And Rand just kind of having objectives and going to them, but not having that solid through line is making him feel a bit more hollow than his book counterpart. They are definitely succeeding in folding in some of the angles of later series Rand in interesting ways, but while I actually like not hyper-focusing on Rand in the first two seasons because this isn't Rand's story as is explicitly said at one point in the series, it's the story of the entire uh, party, season three, 
needs to focus on him, especially with how much careful character work they have missed at this point, and they need to go from back and forward to bring in to allow an audience to understand Rand isn't your typical chosen one. He is a chosen one who will fail repeatedly. He is a chosen one who will sometimes be borderline mad and or kind of evil before going through more incredible changes. Like these things have to be covered more uh, deftly in season three. I like that the first two seasons have allowed Rand to be a kind of like general, we don't know where he's going. You can certainly interpret it that way. But for me to actually really like this Randall Thor season three, I wanna see firmly planted feet for his character, driving a large part of the narrative, him kind of coming into that leadership role for better and worse and having a wider arc uh, theme around him really begin to make sense in terms of like how his flaws and his uh, strengths are going to lead to those failures and successes. And I think one of the ways to accomplish this is yes, going straight to book four and putting some of the best defined characters we've gotten from the show so far around him, because if they're really well understood now from a writing perspective, it's quite easy uh, to then flesh out Rand with having a conflict or non-conflict and just, you know, relationship building between him and those people. And so, yeah, book four has a really good way to put him next to a lot of the best defined characters from this show. So I'm hopeful, but hesitant. And I will say it again, once again, I disagree with Sanderson, the Indiana Jones moment, because we didn't get the nuanced training with Rand, works for me. That was funny, I laughed. I'm sorry, it, I, it worked for me. I noticed this during the editing process for this video. Nynaeve has more sword training scenes than Rand, which is just weird. And it doesn't really reflect anything that's happening with her later on as a character. She's just there training with swords because it's something different and interesting for her to do that I guess is some characterization. But like many scenes from early on in the season, by the time you reach the end, if you go back and watch them, especially with Moraine and Lan, there's this feeling of like, why did this matter? Granted, a lot of them could be made up for if in season four we do see them tie in and have like extreme relevance. It's just, I don't see how many of them could. Total and utter side tangent uh, that I want to address in like a weird way from what I saw on Twitter and uh, like a person on Reddit. I did not invite myself to Sanderson's house. I was invited to Sanderson's house. It was a very good time. I certainly disagreed with him during the live stream. I had more disagreements, but yes, it's genuine hard to disagree with one of the guys who wrote the books, some of them. I was there when it was written. That being said, I'm gonna talk about another point where I think Sanderson might be wrong. <laughs> because everything in context, after watching the series again for a third time, I, I would have just removed the Horn of Valir. I know, very controversial thing to say, but with just eight episodes, I couldn't really see a way to fit time to build out the horn more, unless you remove a whole plot line that wasn't connected to much else, which I guess would be the Moraine's family issue. But that was one of the few things from the show that like kind of really worked it's because it was so divorced from everything else and was essentially the writers telling their own little mini drama uh, during the events of the Wheel of Time. Because let's be honest, none of that's in the books. And yeah, from a writing perspective, it's kind of easy if you have some runtime to just like squeeze in a storyline of your own, execute it and feel like it has some emotional payoff. If that doesn't tie into season three at all though, which I don't feel it will because we're going to book four, it's going to be just time spent on a thing I guess was engaging, but like, why was it there? I get it gave Moraine and Rand a place to hide out in, but it didn't need as much screen time because if you were going to keep the Horn of Elir, cut that and give us more exploration, more diving into the heroes of the Horn, the history of the Horn, why it's so important. And then if you're going to keep the Horn, don't have Matt blow it on a remote wall that seems very disconnected from the rest of the battle and that be like the big moment, have him still in the streets alongside everybody else and make it like a significant charge like we saw in the book. Because on my last like 
watch again the emotions for Matt work. I totally feel it. Like Donald Flynn, so good at just convincing me that this new interpretation of Matt is the one to take the show forward. I loved it. The tear. Oh, that was exactly what I wanted for him as a character. Being told like, no, man, you are a hero after he made the heroic decisions himself. Great. But it's just the technical execution of it. Yeah, I get the heroes go off and are doing more fighting like throughout the battle later on. It's just like it was so insular in the moment. And then there are other strange things like we're told like you didn't cast the most important hero of the horn yet. And so we don't have a great opportunity to meet that person because it was, was just not playing through. Like this is such a golden moment to allow us to meet someone who will be relevant to events later on. And instead we focus on Arthur Hawkwing, which I guess like with the Sean Chan, that works in a way too, but like I see a more important person to focus on in that moment. I'm not gonna talk more about the silly dagger thing, tying it to the stick. There's people who totally think it works, Matt, and there's people who don't. I fall into the latter camp. But again, actually like insularly not connected to everything else, it works in the emotional moment. That's what's so frustrating. It makes this show like so difficult to talk about. It succeeds in a lot of small ways. It's the bigger picture I am very afraid of. I mean, there was the memed on to no end, even like editing mistakes earlier on in the season, which thankfully weren't as prevalent later. I mean, you can guess, speculate whether or not it's because they had more time to work on those episodes or not. But like there's this little bit of carelessness in presentation and in writing at times that is always just like thorns in is what otherwise a really solid journey. I just in the editing of this video found out they fixed the clunky editing when Egwene looks at Nynaeve's accepted ring. I had no idea they were going back and changing stuff, but here is the unedited original that was in one of my episode reviews. And here it is now. So, hey, one of the advantages of streaming is you can technically polish a show after it's released. Oh, alrighty then. Let's get into some more like the early season uh, stuff though. I actually believe in one way I was too harsh on the earlier episodes and that's that I did not give some of the Moraine prep enough credit because I did not like where it went. The whole schism between Lan and Moraine, I mean my opinions, clear on. I think it's dumb and directly betraying uh, the relationship that was established in the first season between them. They were literally bathing together. They were sharing butt water. And now suddenly they can't even communicate despite being together for 20 years about like the deeper levels of sacrifice that following Rand will entail, which which is just wrong to me. That being said, Roseman Pike is so good at portraying reserved conflict within Moraine and what she brings to the table should not be uh, undersold because, well, yeah, I don't like where that conflict goes. I still am relating to and feeling the inner turmoil of someone who manages to keep that reservedness that so few Aes Sedai in this show are, which is a creative choice. I don't think that's uh, accidental. They need their Aes Sedai to act, so they are acting. And also, I didn't pick this up on my first time through. I feel like Alana actually is being positioned quite well to be at the center of a coming conflict within the Aes Sedai, uh, which I didn't fully catch my first time through, but she is someone now who understands multiple sides and has a lot of connections. And so I'm really actually interested with the additional time we have undoubtedly spent with the tower in this show to see how to the forefront uh, that conflict is going to be. And I wish I had noticed that groundwork being laid because I still have total problems with the early episodes. Uh, but this is deliberate. The conflict, the agents, the back play we are seeing set up politically uh, within the tower are the light jabs that lead to the haymaker which is what makes where Leandrin ends up such an interesting point that could be totally fumbled, but I hope really isn't. The unveiling to the wider world that there are Black Aja sisters, that this is real, should just be earth shattering. And I hope very intelligently plays into Swan's part in that conflict because we can't have the exact same uh, reason for the conflict to come to her in the way that it does. It can be similar, uh, but there are just nuances that make the argument of why this big 
uh, I'm, I'm gonna say the word conflict again because I don't, it's vague enough. I don't feel like it's a spoiler. So, <laughs> so we're just gonna go with conflict for a 20th time. It's just once again, even these earlier moments in the tower where we are getting these nice little seeds for the bigger conflict to come are undercut by things that just feel like they're completely dropped due to a lack of runtime available for them. Like Nynaeve, it's hard to explain this to someone who hasn't read the books, totally just shatters what the accepted test should be. Before her, if you were lost in there, you were just considered dead the second the test ended. She then comes back what appears to be a significant chunk of time later. And I know some people push back at me with Egwene and Elaine sleeping. I still think it was just a goofy blocking choice, have them still be arguing, but apparently they just decided to nap there while on their vigil for Nynaeve. If you think that's fine, great. Uh, but her coming out this huge chunk of time later, in my opinion, requires them to at least pause all accepted tests and ask Nynaeve for days on end what the hell happened, how she managed to get out, and the ramifications for people who have probably been lost in there before and their potential still existence. Like, oh my god, dude, there should be like maybe a rescue missions to figure out what happened. Is there a way to reopen these? But nope. Just not gonna bring that up. Which is something I even said that they were not gonna manage to do in that episode review called it. What I'm just trying to say on like a broader picture is I think this show is strongest when it either just very closely sticks to the books, like Egwene largely this season, or decides to boldly go in new directions and not care too much about source material, which frustrates me, but I can't deny they succeed in, like Lanfear, for example. She is so different from the books, but they are really succeeding with that interpretation. It's when the show tries to put feet in both camps, and that's why the end is so hard to land for them, because their feet are so far apart. It's like over here we have done so much backbending work to try and realize important moments from the books directly, but thematically they mean something different because we're largely telling a different story in terms of structure and actual like decisions from characters and huge moments and who saves who. Obviously when a story ends, how far apart those legs are is going to really affect the significance of that impact. I'm gonna quickly pivot my metaphor though. <laughs> and the feet are forced to be just eight inches apart with eight episodes and not a good foot apart, which would provide a more stable footing. Yeah. <laughs> if they had 12 episodes, I feel like they could manage to bend the knees and actually, yes, connect all these things, keep the Moraine plotline, and better explain the Horn of Valir, but we just can't do that with the runtime provided. And it's exactly because of that awkward positioning where you end up with characters like Perrin this season, who had some stuff to go through at the beginning and the end, he needed to be in a specific point, but then there's just a large swath of time with him as well, where he's just kind of walking, and it's due to the fact that they just don't have time to justify a whole lot of agency in the remainder of his screen time, and they just need him to reach a point. It's why he's able to have great moments like his conflict with the White Cloaks, but just padded by so much that felt uncomfortable, and I'm not just talking about the egregious day for night. But the strengths of what they're doing also allow characters like Min to have interesting changes that make me really want to see where they're going to go in the future of the show, and the fact that she is now not a dark friend, but a dark acquaintance, means she could be a someone used to fold in like various character elements that could actually make up for the fact that Min, for just objectively a large section of the books, has nothing to do and just kind of disappears. Like that can be accounted for and actually improved with this medium because like we don't have the same justification of her massive absence in the book and instead like, oh, let's just use that character to fill in this void. And Loghain, like they're setting him up and I'm curious and I really like this interpretation. Just, just not sure. I, I cannot shake a feeling of lack of assuredness for Wheel of Time, while still very much so having fun 
with this season. I still have so much hope though, because there's just these gargantuan improvements over the first season that I hope we see at least half as much improvement for the third season. And like, even on a technical level, I managed to see one of these episodes in front of a giant screen with tons of speakers around me. No, I'm not talking about the Sanderson uh, time. We're actually wearing headphones for that. And the sound effort they are putting in for the design with weaves and impacts. If you're just watching this on a sound bar, I don't mean to sound like a snob, I did for many of the episodes, but you're not getting the full technical display. Like Egwene's punch power display when she has the collar on her was one of the best moments I've heard on a sound design recently. And it was because I was specifically told it's so good by my dad, I went out of way to listen to it on a great system and he wasn't wrong. Whoa! And even the actual physical uh, animation of the weaves, the greater detail we're getting. You can write off the less detail we're getting in season one as just like, we as the viewer are more inexperienced with these weaves. So we're not seeing as detailed. Now in season two, we're seeing the different colors and like flavor for the weaves and the way they actually uh, move or the person who's channeling tends to reflect them a little bit, which is such a nice touch. Still, Overall for this season, I'm feeling a light seven. Obviously bumped up a little bit by the fact that I just love this story. And there's a really big part of my fanboy brain that's just so happy to see many of these scenes on display. I could see being as low as like a five if you're someone who just cannot turn off that hypercritical switch from the books. And if you're someone who just is already able to turn that off easier than myself, which I'm so jealous of if you can, I could see it being as high as like an eight or a nine. The only people I don't understand are the people who are claiming there's zero improvement over season one. You sure about that? <laughs> that is just my ranty thoughts on season two of The Wheel of Time. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Check out our World of the Worlds Kickstarter if you want to get your hands on a book I art directified. And have a good one, y'all. Peace.